accepted to interview for a role at Enron. Enron at the time was one of the largest and most profitable energy companies in the US with annual profits of around $100 billion. So naturally, I was very excited and I overprepared for the interview, which I aced. And I started to dream about the fat package that I would be offered. I started to think about my new life in Houston. My thoughts were very pleasant, except that I did not get the job. Sadly, although they really liked me as a candidate, there was a technicality, and so they were not able to extend the offer. To say that I was disappointed would be a grave understatement. So in May of 2001, instead of starting my new life in Houston at Enron, I drove to Dallas, Texas in search of a new role. I eventually landed a position with a small firm called Data Recovery Services, which, as the name implied, provided data recovery services. It wasn't the glamorous role that I had envisioned. Um, I wasn't going to be living in the city that I admired. And I also would not have the opportunity to apply the technical skills that I really enjoyed for my degree in management information systems, which was SQL and database management. But it was a job. So I threw myself into it. Now, very quickly, I realized that this company had a number of pain points that were basically causing it to lose money. As a data recovery services firm, um, clients would come in with their hard drives that had been damaged, uh, maybe there had been an issue, and they were no longer able to access their data. And so we would undertake a diagnostic, which would run for about an hour or two hours, we would spend time and also have to utilize parts to reconstruct the hard drive, depending on the level of damage. And oftentimes, what would happen is the client would get the diagnostic and would decide that, well, I decided I'm not going to go ahead and continue with you um, on this specific engagement. So they would walk away having not paid for that initial hour of service. And although this was outside of my job description, I realized that there was a very easy fix. Require everyone to pay upfront for the first hour of service. Not rocket science, but it turned out to be very transformational. And the CEO noticed the jump in revenues. There were a number of other procedural and strategic um, improvements that I brought to the company. And I would say, you know, I was going along for the ride and was enjoying it. And then one day at the water cooler, I was having a conversation with a coworker, and she casually made reference to how much she was earning, and I froze. Because I realized that the delta between what she was earning and what I was making was significant enough to give me pause. I did not think that I was any less qualified than she was, and I certainly felt that I had already provided a lot of value to the company beyond my own job description. So of course, I started to think, what should I do? Um, I started to recall the career tips and all the advice that my career counselor in college had provided. I thought about all the material that we were exposed to at the career office. And of course, I also did uh, some research online. So back then, it was Yahoo and MSN.com. We weren't Googling yet. Um, and basically, after mulling over this for a few weeks, I realized I needed to ask for a raise. But I was petrified. Um, this fell outside of the realm of how I had been socialized. Um, so you're supposed to work hard, be likable, um, good things will happen to you, you, know, you will get paid what you, what, you're, what you deserve, and so on. But obviously, that's not quite how life works. So eventually, I put together a slide deck. You have to uh, present data and be convincing. Um, and I actually rehearsed my pitch with my roommate at the time. And I had decided, following Monday, I'm walking into my CEO's office. I'm going to pitch uh, for a raise for myself, and everything will work out. Well, Monday came, and I was petrified. Um, eventually, I mustered up some courage 
walked into his office, I'd printed out a copy of the slides and handed them to him, and I started my pitch with, you know, recounting my performance and also um, the ways in which I had added value to the company. And, you know, he listened intently, was nodding and smiling and agreeing with me till I got to the end where I basically said, um, I am an asset to this company. I have contributed to an X percent increase in revenues, but I do not feel that my compensation reflects that. I would therefore like to request an X percent um, pay rise. And his smile vanished. And he started with, well, absolutely, you know, you're, you have been a positive addition to the team, but we do need to think about managing costs. And I basically rebutted that with, that's true, but again, the value that I bring is significant. So eventually, you know, we sort of went back and forth, but then he agreed to give me a raise. And a couple of months later, I was also promoted. In October of 2001, the Enron scandal exploded. So there had been massive uh, corruption and fraud that had been taking place at the highest levels. Um, top executives were indicted. Um, and actually, you know, unfortunately, one of them even committed suicide. That was a very shocking experience for me personally. And I realized that I had dodged a bullet. Um, I would have been unemployed within months of starting my career, and maybe even more distressing would have been the fact that I would have had the stain to contend with as a young graduate starting my career and as a woman. So there are two lessons that I would like to um, tease out of these stories, and I am going to cheat a little and refer to my notes. Um, and these are lessons that I continue to apply to my life generally, and certainly to my uh, career more specifically. The first is, I now realize the value in opportunities that are smaller and maybe not as glamorous as others. I was enticed by the prestige of potentially working at Enron. But because I started my career in a smaller firm, I had the opportunity to take on additional responsibilities very early on, to learn new skills, to be exposed um, to areas outside of my own core competence, and basically to be stretched in ways that I probably wouldn't have been if I was in a large organization with very clear um, roles and responsibilities. Smaller firms, smaller opportunities, often provide a conducive environment in which to grow and advance. In these companies, because I have had the opportunity to work in both large organizations over the last couple of decades, as well as smaller firms, I always raise my hand. Um, so I throw myself into the deep end. Um, I'm willing to volunteer to do things that oftentimes are outside of my uh, comfort zone or even technical competence, because I challenge myself. I think this water is safe. Um, I challenge myself to want to take a step further and to see how I can deliver in these new responsibilities. And what I do is I work hard, I try my best, I research, and if I need help, I'm unafraid to ask for it. Secondly, I always speak out, even when my voice shakes. When I walked into my CEO's office in 2001, very confident in my ability, but obviously uncomfortable with having to have this conversation, so my voice trembled, but I still spoke, and I got a result. Another challenge that I realize I contend with is the fact that I am a woman, I'm a black woman, I'm an African woman, and I run the risk of being labeled too emotional or angry. The angry black woman. When you're very passionate about a topic and you speak with passion, or if you're assertive, Sometimes you get labeled angry black woman, but even with that, I still speak. And I still speak even if 
my voice shakes. I have been at the decision-making table on a number of occasions where I have been the lone dissenting voice. It would have been easier to just either be quiet or to go along with the status quo, whatever group decision, group think was permeating the room, that would have been the more socially acceptable uh, course of action that probably would have earned me brownie points. But that's not who I am, and that's not what I believe. And what I have found is that 99.9% .9 of the time, even when I have been that lone dissenting voice, I have always been either validated in standing by my conviction, um, or even in pursuing a course of action that I feel is in the best interest of the company, but I've also realized that my courage at the decision-making table has given courage to others who wanted to speak but were afraid to do so. And another important thing is this has helped me to maintain my personal integrity, which is part of my personal brand. And I believe that success, however you define it, does require personal integrity within leadership, and more so as a woman. Working in very competitive environments where you are undermined, uh, sometimes not a lot of it is expected of you, or where you're supposed to fit into certain confined roles, um, I realized that you know, the consistent pummeling can sometimes take a toll on your self-confidence. Um, and I personally, you know, the voice in my head, I have trained that voice to speak positive thoughts. So despite, you know, sometimes feeling overwhelmed, being in very challenging situations or failing at things, my inner voice tells me, you can get up, you can try again, you can do better, you've done it in the past, you'll do it again. I think it's very important as well to have this. Overall, I have a long view of my career. I play the long game. I have not had a linear progression to success, however anybody wants to define it, and there certainly have been a number of failures, setbacks, low moments. Um, I don't preach uh, perfection because I think that that would be um, a lie, but also it's a disservice um, to just only look at the positives, because your moments of growth and inflection points really happen when you are being tested and tried, and even through failures. I am also unafraid to learn new things from scratch, as I've said. I've, I think I've started my career and pivoted a number of times over the last couple of decades. Things have not always worked out perfectly, and like I said, I have a book of failures um, that I'm happy to share. Let's have coffee sometime. Um, but even despite this, I keep raising, um, I'm, I'm wrapping up, I keep raising my hand to take on new roles um, and challenges that will continue to stretch me. And I do continue to say what I believe is in the company's best interest. Ultimately, success is not about big titles, or fat bank accounts, although that, you know, those are nice. I would never say no. Um, but it's really about leading a fulfilled life with purpose, growing personally, and also using one's own talents and resources